A very good evening to the all viewers present today. I am Tofail Sharif. Welcome you all in the second edition of Orem City Literature Fest organized by SGR Knowledge Foundation. This is the sixth and the last session. The session is of 40 minutes with the topic, The Promise of Beauty and Why It Matters. I'm very pleased to welcome the speaker of this session, Mr. Shakti Mayra, sir. Sir is critically acclaimed artist philosopher from India. His work as a sculptor, painter, and a print maker has been widely exhibited and is largely centered in Buddhism inspired in spirituality. It is, a, it is in the collections of the National Gallery of Modern Art in India and in private collections around the world. He has written extensively on art, design and aesthetics and is the author of two books, Towards Ananda, Rethinking Indian Art and Aesthetics and the Promise of Beauty and Why It Matters. He has conducted a number of art workshops in schools in India as well as in abroad and has been a guest lecturer on arts and aesthetics in US colleges. He has been invited to speak at several international events, including the International Arts Education Symposium in Seoul, the Mystics, and the Scientist Conferences in the UK, and the Edinburgh International Festival. We welcome you, sir. I would also like to introduce our moderator for this uh, session, Madam Sanjana Shah. Ma'am comes from an Indian art and real estate background. She is the creator director in her family businesses. Tao, uh, Tao Art Gallery, which is an established cultural hub for Indian modern and contemporary art in Mumbai. As a part of this role, she curates exhibitions, writes concept notes, ideates with and explore tie-ups with new artists and manages the gallery's brand images and sales both in India and internationally. Alongside the gallery, she does independent art consulting and curating for individual homes in collaboration with interior designers and our family's real estate company, Group Satellite in Mumbai. Alongside her work, she is also a passionate writer with her own, refl uh, with her own reflections and art blog titled That Little Brown Eyes. You all can check on the www.littleeyesbrowneyes.com. We welcome you, ma'am. I, before I hand over session to the moderator, I would like to inform all the viewers today that at the end of the session, Sir and ma'am will announce the winner, uh, a winner and the runner-up of the art competition. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Tufel. Thank you for that kind introduction. Hi, Shakti. How are you doing? Yeah. Hi, Sanjana. We could not be able to see you. Oh, that's odd. Wait. Uh, sorry. Oh, hi, hi. Uh, so, hi Shakti, it's so good to be in conversation today. And, My pleasure. And I think we have a very interesting conversation. So, um, Shakti, I mean, of course, I don't think our viewers know this, but uh, you've actually done an exhibition with me uh, in 2018 called uh, Subverting to Great Beauty. So I think the conversation about beauty has been one that we've uh, discussed before and has cropped up many times in your practice as an artist, but also just your thoughts and your philosophies as a thinker and a writer. So um, it's a it's a very interesting topic and a very large uh, topic that you know we will hopefully be able to at least cover a small summary of in the next forty minutes. Um, yeah, so diving right into it. In your book, The Promise of Beauty, you you know, you explain some very interesting questions about what beauty truly means, right? And it's a word that we use really casually now in our everyday life. Um, and it's become vague. We, we aren't very clear about what this word means. Because we use it, we use it for, for surface level things and we don't really understand the depth of it, the meaning of it. Um, and it's also, despite being vague, it's become quite narrow-minded in its sort of judgments and the absolute idea of what constitutes beautiful, what constitutes being ugly. So, um, you know, there are a lot of questions that, that this is. And I think personally, it's something that definitely needs revisiting and exploring 
a more holistic approach to it. And I don't just mean a generic holistic, but I generally, I mean, I think that holistic means creating all of it, not just how it looks or what it, what it does to the viewer, but also why it does that to the viewer and the observer. So I think um, a lot of questions are explored by you your and I start off with asking you, why did beauty in the way? What happened? Why was this sort of, why did the vagueness creep in? Um, do you believe are the re repercussions of this in the loss of the meaning of this word to and um, relationships and our, our environment and the way we live there? Um, I just have one um, request to the organizers that Sanjana's voice is breaking a great deal. If there's some sort of technical fix, that would help. And while they're doing that, let me try and address the question uh, that she has asked me. Um, historically, um, beauty was seen very differently from the way it is seen. Uh, if you go back, um, a long time in both Western civilization as represented by Greek thinking and uh, Indian uh, philosophy and, and Chinese as well, um, the idea of beauty was a much more profound meaning than what we have today. And there are two things that one can briefly mention uh, that have impacted um, the, the sort of lessening of the meaning of beauty, the narrowing, as you said, Sanjana, of beauty. One was in the Renaissance in Europe, where there was a shift that took place from um, what was called an ideal um, sort of sense of beauty to a more sensate sense of beauty. So there was a shift where um, beauty became something that just had to do with one's sensory responses. And the more profound, the deeper resonances of, of, of beauty uh, that existed as represented in uh, notions of truth and goodness and beauty, um, those sort of slipped away. And so we now have beauty as basically just a sensory response of a person to an object. The second thing that happened was that beauty itself became uh, somewhat suspect postmodernism. It became completely relative. There was a, a great deal of concern about you know who's beautiful, who defines who's beautiful, and all the issues that we have seen in feminism, for example, were pointing to an, a, a kind of a strangeness that had occurred as to, in the narrowness, narrowing of beauty, as to who defines what beauty is. So that was a further narrowing that took place. These days, as you know, uh, beauty is very much to do with how things look. It's about prettiness. It's about beauty parlors. It's about cosmetics. It's about window dressing. No, absolutely, absolutely, Shakti. Um, and I think I think the the loss of that has a lot of repercussions on us as a society because we're we're sort of um, you know you've you pointed this out in your book uh, when you say we are progressing society economically, but uh, at the same time there is there you know there's there's an act of there's an in in the sort of feeling and the way we're we're living and there isn't an intrinsic feel of being a part of a whole you know i think um there's there's a lot of uh, loneliness a lot of uh, just 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 not feeling fulfilled you know not feeling satisfied so uh, what are what are some of the repercussions that you think this loss of beauty has uh basically what what's happened sanjana is that two disconnects have taken place 
we have become disconnected with our environment, with our context. Um, and the other is we have become disconnected within ourselves. And what I mean by this is that these days, when uh, we sort of look around uh, our worlds, uh, we are not really that perceptive or sensitive to the presence of beauty, of which there is plenty, especially in nature. And nor are we sensitive to uh, the absence of beauty. And I have this uh, sort of, you know, feeling that what's happened in my lifetime is and thinking about India, which had such a rich history of beauty, such a beautiful country, um, that the ugliness in India has grown enormously. And what's happened is it's so overwhelming that we just kind of close our eyes, we've shut ourselves off from absence of beauty and the presence of beauty. When it comes to our internal world, um, I believe that we all have an innate sense of beauty. What I describe in the book is on Darya Drishti, that it is a capacity and there's a very uh, deep reason for why this capacity exists. And we can go into that if we have time. But basically what's happened is that our Sondarya Drishti we have kind of turned it off. We don't trust the judgments. We are not really wanting to, to respond in a truer way to what we are seeing, what we are hearing, what we are tasting. We are allowing others to tell us what is good, what is beautiful, what we should eat. And we've lost our own capacity to relate. No, very true. Very true. Um, I think I think there's there's a lack of engagement and and just surface level engagement, but true deeper engagement with um, everything that constitutes ourselves, but also um, the world we live in. Um, yeah, so I think Shakti, because you've spoken of about this internal versus external, I'd really like to delve a bit more into this meaning of beauty. You know, um, what do we know about the fundamental essence of it? You know, that there's this external objective sort of, um, you know, property of beauty of the things that are, you know called beautiful, and then there's also this subjective internal experience. Uh, you know, when when some things just fit really well, very aesthetically and satisfyingly well. Fits. There is there is this um, internal and external experience of it. But how is beauty experienced? You know, what, what is your take on this? Number one, I guess the essence of beauty, but also the experience of it, because there are, there are multiple ways to do it. I, I would say that there are two layers which you've explored in your book. If you could explain a bit, that would be um that's a, that's a very uh, good question sanjana actually it's a, it's a nest of questions uh and let me try and unpack it a little um beauty uh, is something that we experience we perceive subjectively all experiences essentially are a subjective experience an individual given whatever our own complexities and our natures and our personalities and our acculturation gives us the sort of background for how we relate to things. So uh, there is subjectivity and uh, the things that make us experience beauty, I'll come to in just a moment. Objectively, uh, we've suffered for a while uh, this notion that there is something called an objective beauty, that it is possible to kind of define beauty, that, you know, there's something absolute. And I think that that is a mistake. It's not that there isn't a way in which one can understand beauty in objects or in things, but that does not take away the fact that the experience of whatever it is, 
will always still remain subjective. And the problem that we've had is that we wanted to decide, is beauty objective or is it subjective? And there's a school of people who think it's only subjective, there's nothing really out there. And there's some people who think that you know, beauty is objective. And what we have to do is to come to an understanding of what this objective, absolute, perhaps mathematical beauty. And there are people, and I've had conversations with scientists, who think that beauty really comes from mathematics. Yes, yeah, so Whereas it doesn't... Sorry, sorry to interrupt. You have that in art as well, right? Renaissance had that sort of uh, golden proportion, as, um, you know, uh, the idea. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and 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 what I want to bring this to is the is the common ground of both the objective aspect of beauty and the subjective aspect of beauty, and this was one of the main things that came out of this inquiry with these 18 dialogues that I had with a range of people was that beauty has to do with relationships. That it's a relational thing. And if you think about it, when we look at an object, we can, you know, a painting or a, a piece of sculpture or a building, uh, there's a way in which you can say that, you know, there's a sense of balance in this. And so something like the golden section um, is a proportion that certainly uh, is used in architecture and uh, it's used in design uh, by, by uh, painters as well, because there's something uh, really uh, profound in that relationship that there is a point in a line where the way that line is divided, the smaller portion's relationship with the whole line is the same as a ratio as the larger width. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, there's something magical about it. And there is a Fibonacci series. There's, you know, the, the whole business of, um, of spirals as a shape that keep a sort of, you know, uh, it, it repeats itself in many forms in nature. So there is a structure that we find through nature, nature uh, that uh, defines certain relationships uh, that always seem to work in a sense. And they work not just aesthetically, they also work structurally. There's strength in them, there's goodness in them, there's, there's robustness, there's longevity. There's a reason that nature has chosen these structures. Now, when it comes to the subjective, that too is a relationship, Sanjana. Because the person who is perceiving is in relationship with the object and the experience of beauty occurs in that relationship. So if, for example, you are constantly mentally hassled or you're in an emotional crisis, it's very unlikely that you are, you are, you're going to perceive beauty because your frame is not there. On the other hand, uh, you could be out someplace in a very good frame of mind and you find that everything seems to be rather beautiful. So the condition of the viewer is important in terms of the relationship that forms, that defines the experience. So this idea of relationships actually leads to something very interesting, and this was um, came through in all the, the the dialogues. That there was a reason why in both Greek and in Indian aesthetics, there were four qualities that were emphasized 
in their aesthetics. There was balance, harmony, proportion, and rhythm. And all of these had been misunderstood for a while in the last 500 years as being things that were somehow fixed, but they weren't. They were a relationship that was contextual. That balance occurs differently in different contexts. There's not a fixed thing called balance. It's not like a seesaw, you know, where the equal weights makes for balance because the rest of the world is not just seesaws. We're full of many different, different things. Likewise, proportion, likewise, harmony, likewise, rhythm. So when you think of these qualitative factors, these four, when there is excellence, either in the object or in the perceiver, in the experiencer, you find beauty. It's really as simple as that. No, I think that was a very, very lovely um, sort of uh, explanation. And I think Shakti somewhere we do have this tendency of seeing things in black and white and seeing things as either this or either that and you see this relational aspect that you've um, highlighted so beautifully i think that's one issue that um the reason why we see beauty quite visibly and you know past the judgments we do um so in your you know as you mentioned in your book have spoken to 18 people from different different backgrounds there have been scientists artists philosophers uh, you know brain scientists social activists even mentalists so beauty was your running theme can you tell me a bit about this journey these situations and also was there something that found was a repeated pattern in all of their uh, dialogues with you something that they all agreed upon yeah well, um, I think that part of the pleasure of um, these dialogues was the sheer quality of the people. And um, I mean, this is the book. Um, and I just read the names of the people who were involved in these. And some of these you will recognize. There was Fritjof Capra, who was a physicist in California. Uh, there was Dr. Uh, Pushpa Mitra Bhargav, uh, who uh, passed away uh, last year, I think, uh, who was uh, one of India's leading uh, uh, biochemists and biologists. Rupert Sheldrake in, in London, in England. These were the three scientists. Then Dr. Karan Singh, Raj Scruton, who is a British philosopher, and Sutish Kumar, who is a Gandhian philosopher also based on women. We had Anjali Ila Menon, who was the painter, Ruth Padel, who was a wonderful poet in, in England, and Ashok Vajpayee, who was a poet in Hindi and uh, a, a cultural, he's done a lot of wonderful work. Um, we had the dancer Geeta Chandran, the painter uh, and designer Muzaffar Ali, and the filmmaker and Gautam Bhatia, the architect, and also a sculptor. Then we had a couple of neuroscientists, because I was interested in what's happening, you know, in the world of, uh, in the brain, the mind, and what is neuroscience going to tell us about the experience of beauty? And we had Samir Zeki, who actually coined the term neuroesthetics, Clifford Saron uh, in the US, and then I had a Tibetan Lama, a reincarnate Lama, Tai Situ Rinpoche, because I was interested in digging into the notions of inner beauty. Uh, then we had Vandana Shiva, uh, the environmentalist. We had Oliver Letwin, who's a politician. I actually met him at 10, in 10, 9 London Street, in the office next to the British Prime Minister. And Kibo Oiva, who's a Japanese um, um, social scientist. And in talking to all these interesting people, 
uh, and they all had an interest in the subject of beauty from their different fields. And it was interesting, Sanjana, that initially uh, they seemed to be coming from slightly different perspectives. And as the conversation deepened, the one thing that we all came to an agreement on was that beauty is something that is relational excellence and it can exist in everything. So whether it's a painting or a sculpture or a flower or a building or a human being, relational excellence defines beauty. And relational excellence is also what defines goodness. And if you can see relationships without any distortion, you're actually in touch with the truth of life, with the truth of things. So it all kind of slid back into bringing beauty away from the sensate phase back into something much more profound. And every single one of these dialogues ended with this uh, strong sense that beauty is something much more important. We're kind of losing it by putting it away in, you know, cosmetics and beauty parlors and thinking that that's what is beautiful. That beauty is something extremely important. If we want a world that has more well-being in every aspect, if we were just more concerned about beauty or its absence, we could make so many things, everything possibly, better. Very, very, very true, Shakti. And I think, um, you know, because you mentioned the history, how that was the reality earlier, and we sort of lost that over the ages. Um, you know, it's interesting because focusing on the Indian context, we have sort of philosophical, mythological roots in our own history. Um, of beauty and its implications. So the Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram, loveliness, beauty, that's something that's obviously recurring in our philosophy and Satchitanand, truth, uh, righteousness, bliss. So again, these are themes that repeat um, in, our, in our roots. And so you know, what do you have to say about that? What have you explored on that front of things? Well, I mean, um, uh, as I was indicating, that the moment you, you understand beauty uh, in its completeness and in its depth, you can't separate it from goodness, from well-being. Uh, if somebody says, you know, something is beautiful, and it's like, you know, somebody's, uh, the, the, the term has been used, it was a beautiful war. And somehow there's a dissonance in that idea that uh, a war uh, hardly can be beautiful. I remember a, a conversation uh, with Ruth Fidel, who uh, was telling me that uh, she's met people um, who think that destructive moments, like when the planes crashed into the World Trade Center towers in New York, somebody said, a fairly well-known person, I won't repeat his name, said that that was the most beautiful thing he'd seen. So you can see that uh, there was a complete separation of goodness from beauty. Yeah. And the... Um, when you think of Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram, this was in, in, in the Indian understanding, in Indian wisdom, the realization that these were three ways in which we were looking at the same thing. It was like a three-sided prism. The one thing could be seen through the plane of goodness, the same thing 
could be seen through the plain or beauty. And the same thing was the truth. So it's really one thing, but yeah. we have this yeah. term that, that talks about it as, as three different things. And each of these, Sanjana, are basically doors, windows into that same center yeah. of, of, of things that are profoundly in harmony, things that are profoundly yes. Yes. well. Very true. Um, and, and as an artist, because now I really want to, you know, go go to your practice, because um, I've worked with you as an artist. And, you know, of course, you've, you have a very splendid way of, you know, I think um, because of the exhibition we did together, we explored the idea of contemporary art somewhere aesthetically pleasing art is known as lesser or not true art. Um, it's become contemporary art is so much more about the mind of the artist. And, and the sort of concepts. Um, so how do you bring this notion of beauty, this sort of, uh, you know, overarching, united idea of beauty, uh, intrinsic idea of beauty into your practice as an artist? Yeah, as, as you, you've also uh, probably seen, Sanjana, that uh, when you look at um, uh, the last maybe 100 years in contemporary art, it's become very conceptual. It's just dealing with one aspect. And I um, intuitively came to a, a different place many years ago when I had started working as an artist in my 20s that I wanted my art to happen, to work at four levels. I wanted it to work at a sensory level because part of the engagement is sensory, the colors, the lines, that there had to be something in that that was pleasant to the viewer. Um, I, wanted some, I wanted my work to have an emotional content that I didn't think that a human being experienced without some emotion or emotions being involved in it. I wanted it to have an intellectual content. So it was not just a sensory thing, how it looks. It was not a sensory and emotional thing, how it felt. I also wanted it to have some depth and richness in terms of intellectually what it might mean. And for me, uh, there was a fourth, which I sort of, you know, I didn't know how, how to put it, but it was neither sensory nor emotion nor the intellect, it was something else. And it was spiritual for me. It was where, uh, it was the field of, you know, uh, it, it was at the heart of consciousness. That when we have experiences, uh, and if we are in touch, there's also this sort of remnant quality in us that we sometimes use the term spiritual for. So I wanted my art to work at all four levels. And one of my criticisms and complaints about contemporary art is it's just wanting to work at the intellectual level. You can have some really ugly things so the sensory experiences a disaster. Emotionally, most of them are trying to make you angry because they're protesting something. There's very little of the other kind of emotion. And I wish there was more because there's a lovely range of positive emotions as well. And spiritually, I won't criticize the work quite as much because they are also trying to do something transformative and I respect that greatly. But at the same time, I feel that they're doing it in a, in a very narrow space. They're doing it more in a so socio-political space. And I feel that human beings also have a very strong spiritual uh, basis. So for me, that seems to be a, a little dry. 
you know absolutely i have to agree with you on this because um i think i think this holistic approach uh, makes a lot of sense um because i have a lot of clients you know and and the audience that i cater to in dao coming to me and sort of asking for art that um you know and and it's a very innocent ask but they they want art that they can really resonate with and that makes them feel positive and makes them feel you know um satisfied or fulfilled and i think it's probably this intrinsic desire for beauty or harmony that we all have it's a very innate uh, tendency so i'm agreement with you on this um yes and also sanjana i should add that um as an artist i'm not trying to make beauty as such because i know know that beauty eventually will be an experience for the viewer and viewers will sort of experience differently so for me beauty forms if i'm able to provide uh you could say uh some degree of energy to all four levels yeah. so the beauty is really an outcome of the artistic process it's not what i'm trying to actually do self consciously Yeah. So Shakti, we're actually, um, you know, we only have another few few minutes left. It's time flew by very fast. Um, I think to summarize, you know, I think we've definitely gotten the basic idea of what this this concept of beauty is, and that beauty comes in this range and variety that's relational. Um, there is, you know, as you said, to quote you from your book, intrinsic beauty and diversity. So, um i think that's that's definitely the major takeaway from today's session and that our reality is interactive it is you know um and we need to be more aware of that it's just in terms of um, so any yeah. last sort of comments to our view for our viewers before we you know end this are there to fail are there any sort of uh, questions uh, yeah. sanjana Um, uh, no, sir. We haven't got any questions yet, sir. Yeah. Then, no, um, if anyone has questions, please um, punch that in so I could uh, definitely ask. Um, sure, ma'am. I just check. We haven't got any, but I'll let you know if I get any. Yes. And let me then take this moment. Um, you know, the reason why I wrote this book was to not just have a discussion with eighteen people, but I hope that it would stimulate. a discussion amongst many more people and i would encourage you so in that spirit um get engaged with the question of beauty and its importance uh, in our lives and if you read the book i think it would stimulate you regardless of whether you were a scientist or you were studying uh law or you were a, you know an a, a budding artist or a environmentalist um you will find a path into uh this uh this issue and so i i would love it if more people got into this discussion uh with themselves with their friends and uh with their communities i would i wish for a more beautiful world basically thank you so much akti it was such a pleasurable conversation and i'm sure um there was a lot to take away from this and um i'm going to hand it over now to to sir to close let me thank you to sanjana uh for being a wonderful having a wonderful conversation with me i enjoyed it greatly thank you shakti indeed it because i was listening for the entire session i get to know there is a definition of a beauty and it has a varieties as now ma'am said and the sir shakti sir has given insights about the uh, spirituality the concept of spirituality and the different concepts thank you so much sir uh, as i have mentioned before now we will be announcing the winner and the runner up for the art competition there were many entries for this competition this year we are thankful to our judge ms smita tijare ma'am for a support in judging the competition 
she has gained a name in the field of creative arts and we are really thankful for her support in this now i request uh, shakti sir to please announce the winner for the competition should i announce uh, the runner up first sir uh, uh, yes apologies to all uh, we'll announce the uh, runner up first sanjay ma'am please do this honor yeah 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 so the runner up for the art competition is um priyanshi mehrotra congratulations to her um and shakti please do announce the winner and the winner uh, is uh, surya chakra and i would just like to say a quick word uh, to both of you uh, keep it up um and remember that seeing in its widest sense not just using your eyes but seeing as completely as you can is what you need to develop to be the promising artist that you are showing yourself to be thank you thank you thank you so much uh, so we are uh, done with our announcements Uh, thank you so much, sir and ma'am. On behalf of Orange City Literature Festival, we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us. So we are here come to an end of our three-day event, Orange City Literature Fest 2020. After hearing our speakers and gaining knowledge from the sessions, let's refresh ourselves and join a musical event by Mame Khan. Thank you and have a fun evening ahead and please log the dates for the next year Orange City Literature Fest season 3 that is from 26th to 28th November 2021 see you all till then stay happy stay safe thank you thank you 20 years of existence two universities 23 educational institutes offering 137 courses rice only group of institutions a vision beyond